Um, we got quite a few of those, and there's two more coming up today. So nothing else you could come in here and cool off from a day like today. <laughs> but you're interested in what we're talking about or not. And hopefully you're going to learn something. I'm uh, Joe Willis. I'm the Orleans Parish Extension Agent here. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is the pro controlling pests with biopesticides and alternatives to I had a hard time coming up with the, the last part of that title because um, it's controlling pests um, without synthetic chemical pesticides, but how much do you call it? I mean, it's the ones that we manufacture, but it's also alternative to things like uh, pyrethrins. Pyrethrins uh, originally came from the pyrethroid daisy, so they really aren't synthetic, even though now they do make synthetic ones. Uh, and so, the idea is alternatives that are less harsh on the environment. And we have several of those. Um, the one are what I call soft alternatives. And they, I call, call them soft alternatives because they have very little environmental impact, especially you know, all of these things have to be used according to the label instructions. Um, and then there are the biopesticides. And when we get to that part of the presentation, we'll see that there is an actual strict definition of what a biopesticide is, and there are different classifications of those. So what I want to do is go through this, tell you something about what these are, uh, some of the mode of action, what they do, uh, what they can be used for, how you might want to use them, and then you guys can ask me any questions you want. And if I don't know the answer, I've got a couple of master, three or four master gardeners in here that I'll put them to the test and see if they really know what they uh, were supposed to learn when we talk in the class. <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> okay, all right. So the first one I want to talk about, this is one that everybody's heard of, is the horticultural oils. And the thing about the, the horticultural oils, one thing you want to know is that it's non-selective. It is a contact pesticide, which means it only controls what you get it on. However, any insect that you get it on, it's going to control it. That's, you know, the non-selective, the contact part of it. And the way it works, um, it gets on the insect, they get covered with the oil, it suffocates them, and also the oil, because of the way they are designed, they disrupt the cell membranes of the insects, uh, of the fungi, and if you have a disrupted cell membrane, you're gonna leak all your fluids out and you're gonna die. And so they have that effect too. And because it's more of a physical effect, it's kind of like, you can think of it as a fly slaughter, so to speak. There's never going to be insect resistance developed to a fly slaughter because of its mode of action. I mean, squat, squish, unless uh, a fly can develop a really hard shell, there's never going to be resistance developed. And so that's the same thing with these horticultural oils. Because of their mode of action, it's very unlikely, and scientists always have to use words like that. We never say never. And we never say always, because nature is nature. You never know really what might happen. But it's highly unlikely that there would be any resistance. Um, it is effective against insect eggs, which is really nice. And these are some of the insects that they choose to control. Uh, a lot of times they're soft-bodied insects, like the aphids and scale insects, things like that. But uh, some of the tougher insects, it will control them. Uh, some of the diseases, like the powdery mildews and rust, so it does have some effect on those. Um, with all of these, and this, all the stuff that I'm telling you here, most, except for the modes of action, all that, most, especially all this will be on the label. And it's really important to use the label as an instruction manual for any pesticides that you're gonna use, because that is probably the most informative document on those particular products that you're getting ready to use. Um, it can have a phytotoxic effect, especially on very young tender tissue, or if it's used when the temperatures are hot. Uh, the higher temperatures intensifies, it can actually have a direct effect, or it can have like a micro uh, magnifying glass effect. On the top of the leaf, it can actually magnify the sun, uh, heat it up, and cause burn spots on plants. And some plants are a little more sensitive than others, uh, but that's one thing you want to know. Uh, that's why I got that there about the high temperatures and the high humidity. And if the temperatures are real low because, well, know what happens as the temperature goes down on oils, they tend to get uh, stiffer, 
and not as liquid, and if it's not a liquid, it's not going to cover the insect and do what it's supposed to do. So on at low temperatures also. And the thing with the sulfur compound, you don't want to use sulfur compounds mixed with it or spray it immediately after because the front there some impure, quote impurities in the oils. There are highly refined oils, but there's some stuff in there that with the sulfur compound that actually react and, and make another compound which is phytotoxic to the plant that will cause problems. So that's one, it's on the label. Usually it's not a problem, but most people are using the horticultural oils alone. Dr. Joe? Yes. Would you like questions at the end or throughout the presentation? If anyone has questions uh, during the presentation, that's great because I will be going from product to product and uh, you might not remember at the end of it. Is that appropriate to use on roses? On roses? Yes. It is. It is. Yeah. Can I ask what kind of effect it would have like on lizards and birds or other things in there that you were spraying? Uh, most, most of those, you know, because with the horticultural oils are used at a very low percentage of oil, like from one and a half to two percent at the most. So spraying animals and insects, like if you got it on a bird, it just might make it slicker. Got it on a, you know, an amphibian, an insect, something like that. It's not going to really cause any problem. Um, so you the you the hive. No, nope. no. If, if that happens and you spray the horticultural oil, look at what else is going on because it's not the oil that's going to do that. So it's safe for them. However, you know, with like pollinators, like I said, if a pollinator is flying around and you spray it, it's going to die. Yes. And you just answered part of my question. If I spray my citrus for leaf miners with that, it'll upset the butterflies and the bees too. Right? Well, the thing about it, they have to be there when you're spraying. So if you spray it and they're not flying around, once it gets on the plant, it's not going to affect the pollinators at all. They have to actually be drenched with it. And that's what you're doing when you're spraying for the leaf miners. They're actually on the plant and you're spraying the little flies and such. Before and the eggs that are there are gonna hatch out before uh, they get into the leaf. And so they're present, you spray them, they'll affect them. If they aren't there when you spray, it's not gonna affect them. So that brings up another point, I don't know if I have it up here, uh, but there's no residual activity. So like with white flies, if you, everyone's seen them, you bump the bush and they all fly up in the air. Well, you bump the bush and they fly, all fly up in the air and then you spray the plant. Well, when they come back, it's not going to affect them because they weren't there when you sprayed them. And uh, the smaller the droplet size, the better it works because you get more coverage. The next one is insecticidal soaps. And those are potassium salts of uh, long chain fatty acids, and they are also non selective. They are a contact uh, pesticide. And what happens is the fatty acids will interpolate into the cell membrane and affect the structure and the permeability of those cell membranes. So it will once again cause leakage and like the horticultural oils, it can also cause suffocation as it gets on the insect, blocks the, the spiracles, the breathing apparatus of the insects, and it can suffocate them as well. And also it is a soap. So uh, another effect that it can have is it can remove the waxy protective layer of insects. Kind of washes that off of them. And just like if you have a plant inside and suddenly take it outside and see it kind of wilt and dry up and everything it's because it doesn't have its waxy layer developed on its leaves because it was inside where it didn't need it so much. Same thing happens to the insects and everything. Now it won't wash it off the leaves because so it's not that high of concentration. But it can also remove the waxy coating sometimes, uh, especially on the so the ones that exude a waxy coating as a protective mechanism and then they dry out and they just dissipate and die. Uh, it does not affect eggs because <coughs> if there's uh, no residual activity whatsoever so it's not going to have any effect on insect eggs or as or horticultural oil as well because once they coat the egg they kind of stay there whereas insecticidal soaps will coat it and then when it dries they kind of uh, they're not there anymore, and so they don't do anything. So the soft biting insects, uh, here's a list of things. Oh, by the way, just so you know, that we are recording these presentations that will be on the uh, Spring Garden Show website, and we're gonna put them on the MGG and other Master Gardeners website, so if you wanna go back and look at things later on, uh, if you wanna look at it and say, wait a minute, he said this, I just found it, it isn't. Email me so I can correct it. <laughs> 
But these are the kind of insects it controls. Um, some notes to know about that is the longer the plant stays wet with those insecticidal soaps, the more effective it is because they are coating. And like I said, once they dry, they're not doing anything. So with something like the insecticidal soaps, you aren't supposed to, you know, you don't want to water your plants in the morning and get that, that coating of water on them um, because that will increase infection with uh, fungi and things like that. But with insecticidal soap, spraying them during the cool part of the day, the morning or the evening, is better using uh, when you're using insecticidal soap because the longer that they stay in a liquid film form, the longer uh, they're going to work and the better they're going to work. Um, Zero residual activity. Um, the salt water thing, that um, is also on the label. When you mix it with hard water, you can have precipitants form because there's no telling, you know, hard water just means it's high in salts. And so they can react with the fatty acids and it depends on what is causing the water to be hard. Not all hard water would do it, but as a general precaution, you just don't want to mix it with hard water because they can form those phytotoxic toxic compounds. Um, like the oils, they can be an irritant to mucous membranes, but what they're doing is causing drying out. And so breathe, using uh, protective breathing apparatus is a good idea. It's not required, but it's a good idea. And uh, the oils, I think, had the same precaution about using it near bodies of water. Um, that's because um, just like controlling mosquitoes, sometimes you put stuff that's close on the surface of the water. And so Things will tend to do that, stay on the surface of the water, and may affect insects and things that you really don't want to have an effect on. And plus, if you get it in the water, it's going to spread for further distance. So, so those are the insecticidal soaps. Yes? So you have lace spots for this and the oil? Yes. This one would be preferable for like azaleas. You can go spray them with the lace spots. The, the azalea lace spot? Yeah. The, most of the time, I tend to use the the insecticidal soaps, if I can, instead of horticultural oils. Sometimes the horticultural oils are a little more effective on an insect that uh, isn't quite as soft-bodied as an apiate or something. But the insecticidal soaps are a little less harsh and less likely to have a phytoconsum effect. But you know, with the lace bug, since it is on the underside of the leaf, good coverage on the underside is important. And the thing with the uh, insecticidal soaps and with the horticultural oils, the nice thing about this is there's almost no time delay in use of them. So with something like this, a spectrum of contact one that just mans 100% coverage to get good effect, what I like to do is to spray and then a week later check. Because if the insect wasn't there when I spray, it's not going to be dead. Or if I happen to not get 100% coverage, they're not going to be dead. So follow that a week later with another application just to get those that were off visiting grandma when you spray or that it's an area that you missed when you were spraying. You don't have to worry about uh, how often you spray because it seems like the lake bugs are pretty, you know, they're kind of hard to get rid of. Yeah, and so that's why I think I would do the repeat spraying with those. And sometimes on the label they'll say, uh, reapply every seven days or something. And, and a lot of times that delay is because they want you to make sure that what you see is something that is there. Some people actually will spray and it will kill the insect and they see the dead body of the insect on the plant and they don't think it was effective. Right. They don't realize it's the dead body of the insect. Well, after a week's time, most of those would be dehydrated anyway, and so no one would mistake it for a live insect. So if you have a little bit of a time delay, you can better assess how effective your spray application was. And uh, we just found out recently that there's, we're going to talk about this compound in a little bit, uh, this pesticide. Um, uh, what is Spinosad. Spinosad. I to say they're actually now making insecticidal soap that they incorporate the spinosad into the soap. So you have an insecticidal soap that has spinosad in it, and they call that um, insecticidal super soap. So they add another name to it so you can so you can differentiate it, you know, as you're looking at the bottle, but it has spinosad in it. And you'll see that, that's a really good one that you'll see later. So what they're doing is combining two things like that into one. 
uh, neem oil, sure everyone's heard of neem oil, and that's from the neem plant, and it comes mainly from the seeds, and actually there are several products that come from the neem plant. The neem oil, which is how it will be sold under the name neem oil, and that is 70% clarified <coughs> hydrophobic extract of the neem oil, and then there are other things that come out of that same extract that are also pesticide. And those, like I have up there, the azadoraptin, that would be the active ingredient that you see on some other compounds, and I'll mention those in a minute. Um, but as azadoraptin isn't really one compound, it's 25 or more different related compounds that when they do the alcohol extraction from the raw pressed neem oil, they end up with the one portion which they then take the uh, azadoraptin from, and the other portion is the clarified hydrophobic extract of the neem oil, and that's the one that then is sold as neem oil. It again is a um, contact insecticide, pesticide, it can also have effect on fungi, so it's insecticide, fungicide type deal. Uh, it has no persistence, and it really breaks down rapidly, so if you're concerned about things lingering in the environment, say it's a spray and goes on the ground, and UV light and microbes break the neem oil down really fast. They actually eat the neem oil, uh, the <coughs> beneficial microbes. So it's food for them. I just put this up here because it's fun. Because down here we all know what the China berry tree looks like. Um, we've seen them growing wild, or some people have to grow them for, on purpose. Uh, the, this is it, um, the neem oil tree. Is that right, the indica? And these are in the same family that we're ready. Look at them, they look a lot alike. And actually, the chinaberry tree does have those same properties in its seeds of <coughs> insecticidal and fungicidal activity. But the levels are lower than in the neem tree. So no one's ever really you know, pursued using the chinaberry tree for that purpose. But it has those same things in it. So where does where does the neem tree grow? Is it it's a tropical tree. Okay, uh, so it's, there's plantation somewhere? Yeah, you see, you know. Where would that be from if it's in Indica? <laughs> yeah, it's over there in that area. And um, yes, they grow, they have plantations over that they harvest the seeds and, and do the extraction. At the neem oil, raw neem oil, so to speak, is in all parts of the plant but it's in the highest concentration in the seeds, so that's all they collect and extract it from because it's not worth it to take it from the whole plant. Plus, if you destroy your whole plant, you gotta start over. Yes? If you're trying to control uh, the uh, rust mites for citrus, which of these three products do you prefer? For them, I would go with the neem oil because nice, I, nice thing with the neem oil it also has some fungicidal activity. So when you're spraying for those rust mites early on, you're also protecting it from uh, the early infection fungi that can get on it. Uh, there you see here how the, the neem oil works. It does the same thing, suffocates the insects. Um, if anyone's ever smelled concentrated neem oil, you know it has an odor. That's not what repels the insects, but it does have some um, repellent activity against you know, in certain mites and other insects. And so when you spray with the horticulture oils on the neem oil, they're on the plant, they're going to kind of stay there unless it rains and it washes off and everything. So that's why the neem oil, even though it doesn't have residual activity on the insects that you spray because it is contact, uh, it still can have some repellent activity as long as it's there on the plant. And the way it affects the fungi, uh, the spores have to land on the plant and then germinate and then they form a, a I call it an aprosorimus, kind of the spike that they stick into the plant so they can infect it. Well, what the Nemo does, it helps prevent the germination of, the, of those spores. And so that type can prevent uh, fungal diseases. And it also, also <laughs> a mucous membrane irritant. Now, the other part that comes from the neem oil is uh, azadoraptin. And it has multiple effects on insects. Um, as you can see, there's no fungicidal activity with these. Uh, but these, I 
But they'll get because they are a natural product that has been extracted and utilized, and it's not quote a synthetic chemical. It's just the other part of the neem plant, the neem oil that's been extracted. Um, if you know that, then seeing names like Azathin XL and Azamax with you know their active ingredients and you know, they have to be EPA registered, of course the soaps and the oil that was portable for the other dude, they have to pass uh, be labeled by the EPA as well. But as I the Azadarac as I mentioned, it's actually a mixture of compounds and it works as an antifeedant, the insects land on the plant that has this on it, kind of turns them off, they don't want to eat, they go somewhere else. Um, on the younger insects, it actually stops their growth and development, so the roads that go through the metamorphosis are, the, that, that change is interrupted, the life cycle is essentially halted where they are. Um, a sterilant, so the adults that are on there and develop on the plant, which you treat with the azadaractin, they actually can't go out and make any babies, so it helps reduce the increase in the population. It also acts as a repellent, and the repellent part of that is it inhibits the insects from laying eggs. That's the of a position inhibitor. Uh, it stops them from laying eggs on your plants. So, another effect. Now, it does have some systemic activity, which is nice, as all the ones we've talked about so far were strictly contact pesticides. Yeah. Is that the products? that have azadaractin in them as an active ingredient. Uh, it does have some systemic properties to it. And so uh, when you, you actually can use it as a root drench and it will be taken up by the plant, spread throughout the plant and will inhibit uh, leaf chewing insects. And this one's, they're still doing studies, so I don't know if I need to up this number or not, um, but because of the demand for it and the great product that the neem oil and the azadaractin are, they're still looking at the different types of insects. At least 60 so far of insects and a dozen fungal diseases are being controlled using these different products. And this one, Thiatomaceous Earth, that's just diatoms that are crushed up and utilized in, and they are sized. Um, we all know about you know what diatoms are, those are little microorganisms living in the, in the ocean and around. Um, it's actually mostly silicon dioxide. It's silicon dioxide. I don't know if I had that fact up there, but I think 70% of the Earth's minerals is sil silicon dioxide. It is a huge percentage of minerals on the Earth. Most people have probably never even heard of it, at least not but by calling it silicon dioxide. It is very common, it's all around. But what with, with this, what they're doing is they're taking it and they're sizing it. Uh, you can see here it's milled to 10 to 50 microns. It has to be very fine to do the job. It's kind of like, you know, walking on gravels really hurts your feet. Walking on boulders, that's no problem. That's the same thing with some of these things that have a physical effect on the pest you're trying to control. If they're too large, I mean, it goes around, goes over them, doesn't affect them. So it's the studies and, and size of these different products that are really important. So you can't just take the, the coral or anything like that and grind it up and expect it to have the same effect. But yeah, I forgot to mention with the insecticidal soaps, uh, you'll find um, recipes online and all that using Dawn, dishwashing soap, all that. They may work or they may not. The thing is, to have the effect that an insecticidal soap has, it needs to be long chain fatty acids. And with those different dish soaps and all that, they don't tell you how long the chain, what, how, how long those chains are. They may be short, they may be long, it may be a mixture, it may work, it may not. One brand may work really good, another brand won't doesn't, but if you buy the insecticidal soaps, those are regulated, so you know they're gonna do what you're supposed to do um, because of, they are regulated by the size of the fatty acids that are there, the chains, and they aren't that expensive, so you really don't 
save a lot by mixing your own. Um, back to our diatomaceous earth, um, it, it's like crawling over razor blades for insects. It braces, has very sharp edges, and it speeds up the process of drying out the insect. Just the product itself tends to suck the moisture out of the insect. Um, you know, like us when we get different types of powders or things on our hands, it just they tend to absorb and dry us out. Well, that's what this is doing to the insect. Uh, the razor edges, as you can see here, this is what it looks like. There's our diatoms, and there's what it looks like after they've been crushed up uh, and put into a product like this that has really sharp edges. It can cut crawling insects, like you know, larger ones like caterpillars and things like that, essentially causing them to die by a thousand <laughs> sharp cuts. Yes? How is it applied? It's applied as a powder. Uh, you can make a slurry and apply it. It doesn't have um, as much effect, but it's applied as a powder. And a lot of times, to protect like from cutworms and things like that on your young plants, you just make a little um, band around your plant and on the top, yeah, and it will have the effect. Now, like I said, people have used slurry to it, but it tends to lose its effectiveness once it gets wet. So. If you use it like that, and then we have a hot to have rain like we have here, we need to go out and reapply it. And, and you can just use it over and over and over. It's not going to be a problem. And if you, you know, putting it out as a powder, yes. How does this compare to Dipel dust? Dipel is um, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's going to be up here. That is um, spores from a bacterium, which is really different from this. This is just totally physical effect. The BT, actually there's a chemical effect that goes on. This is a really interesting story. I hope I don't bore you guys to sleep till we get to that one, because you're gonna like that one. <laughs> and you can see that the diatomaceous earth is used for a lot of different things, um, not just plant tests. You can use it for bed bugs and cockroaches and crickets and fleas and ticks and spiders. So it can be used for a lot of different things, but because of its drying effect and those micro abrasions, you can call it, you don't want to get it in your eyes or breathe in the dust. It's not going to kill you, but it's going to be painful. Is it really effective for fleas if you dust it over the lawn? Yeah, because you know the flea is a is a you know very soft and that, but it would probably take quite a bit. Um, I know I've talked to you could actually kind of put it on your pet if you wanted to. Uh, but uh, dusting it out on the lawn, it will affect. Um, but if you have fleas, like if you have a dog, you know that the fleas, if they are on your dog and you dust it on your lawn, then it's not gonna stop the ones that are on the dog. Because they're not gonna jump off on the lawn. They wanna stay on the dog. Yes? How do you use it against roaches? Did you say roaches? Yeah, kind of like boric acid, you know, put it along the area where the roaches are going to crawl. Uh -huh. And it dries them out. It dries them out and cuts them because roaches are soft bodies. Wow. And it can have an effect on them. It's a pretty indiscriminate killer. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. I've heard people say it works for slugs. For slugs? Yeah. Um, it would tend to dry them out. Yeah. Yeah, it would take, them, take more probably than the normal application on the smaller creatures, but yeah, it will dry out the soil. Yes, sir. Does it have any impact on the soil conditions as far as growing different plants? Like, for example, don't use it on plant type A, because it'll do something bad to it. No, there's no uh, precautions upon, uh, on what plants you could use it on. Okay. Does water neutralize it? Somebody told me that water neutralizes. It tends to, yeah, to do that because it, it changes in how, how it affects, because since it is a desiccant, it is one of its primary modes of action. Well, once it's water sawed, it no longer has a desiccant effect on the insect, and that's why water can more or less neutralize it. It doesn't go into solution, it just has all the water it can absorb, so it's not going to dry off the insects that are there anymore. Kale and clay. 
Um, this is the one that which I really you know, like. I don't like it to see people use. I just find out more how it works. Um, Kelly Clay, it's named that. I forgot all the different names, but it's from, named, uh, from a region in China where it was first found. Um, that's the chemical composition. If we have a chemistry here, wants to pronounce that for us, we can. <laughs> or like aluminum silica oxide hybrid or something like that. But that's what it is. And it's been used uh, in pottery and in fine porcelain for, for centuries because it was really a smooth clay. And originally, people using it to control pests on um, plants thought it would be a great idea, and they were using it, and okay, it's not really having much of an effect. It's not doing what we thought we would do, and so it kind of lost favor for a while. But then some people started going back and looking at it, and it was going back again, size. But this product size matters. Large uh, particles are very ineffective. And so to get this product here, which is one of the, which is easily found right now, I think there are a few more out right now, but this is the first one I saw, the first one I uh, saw commercially available. This is what it looks like on a standing electron micrograph of it, the clay particles. And so they use a super magnetic centrifuge to refine the kale and clay and remove all the, the raw large particles out. And then they filter that and the size needs to be 1.4 microns. And I'm not even gonna try to describe, I can't think of anything I can try to describe to you to be an example of how small that is. But they have to be that small. And there's, um, it's in Georgia, there's a manufacturer that does this to produce the pesticide product, surround, made from kale and clay. And you may have already read it, but there's some really interesting you know, properties about this. What it does, it forms a, a film, a barrier on the plant when you spray it. And, um, I think I took this right from the manufacturer's label. It says it's you know, a barrier film that acts as a broad spectrum, agricultural crop protective for crop and all those different things. Total plant coverage is important. And what it does, it essentially, the insects are flying around looking at this plant and they don't recognize it as what it is. So if it's a tomato pest, and it flies over a tomato plant that's been treated with kale and clay, it doesn't even see it as a tomato plant. It just keeps looking for tomato plants. It doesn't even stop. And usually you have to treat, because um, you're putting them on a fine layer of the solution, a slurry, and you treat them three times and they get a good coating. They will look like this. These leaves did get treated, or they would be covered with this, you know, with kind of this white powder. And the great thing about that, you would think, okay, you've got green leaves covered with this white powder, so there's going to be a reduction in photosynthesis in my plant. So am I like turning the sun plant into a shade plant? Well, they've done studies, and there was absolutely no negative effects on plant photosynthesis or respiration. So the fineness of the particle, even though we see it as coating the plant almost completely, it does have no effect on photosynthesis. Yes, sir. How do you apply it? it? You mix it as a slurry and you can spray it on. Um, but you might have to, you know, check the label and see how, what types of equipment they recommend because anything that has, you know, properties like this, clay is very fine, it's not likely to be abrasive on your spray equipment. Something like the dichromation earth that you were trying to put it on, it could be um, affect your Equipment. But you mix a slurry, um, spray it on a slurry because it is non soluble. Yes, sir. Does it work uh, for stink bugs? Uh, I think on the label it does say it has been worked because I know they use it on tomatoes for that to uh, keep the stink bugs away. Um, and it, it washes off real easily with water. Good thing, bad thing if we have a lot of rain, time to put it on again. And if you got plants that are growing rapidly, those new shoots and everything that are coming out, they're not gonna be covered with what you sprayed on two days ago. So those new shoots are nice and green and the insect will fly over and say, I don't know 
what that thing is that it's attached to, but I know that's a tomato plant I'm gonna land the feed. So you do have to make sure if you got rapid growth and repeat to keep that new growth covered. Yes. Is this an ex more expensive product? It's a little higher cost than say insecticidal soap, but it's not a super expensive product, really, even though they have to go through that you know, highly manufacturing process. Yes? Oh, it seems like this one might be the best to try to kill the bad bugs to keep the good bugs alive. Are you going to have a part of your presentation where you talk about how to use these so that you're not killing the pollinators and stuff like that? Uh, not that addresses that specifically. I try to hit that with each one, you know, like with insecticidal soaps and everything, don't spray them on your, it only kills what you spray it on, so spray it at a time when your beneficials aren't there, and they aren't going to be effective because they have no residuals. Uh, but I don't, do not address that specifically, but uh, you can ask and I'll try to answer it. I saw Dr. Ryan just walked in, so if I say anything wrong, he's going to correct me. <laughs> But, and another thing, though, it does not affect um, the plant photosynthesis, it can delay fruit maturation. And it's a real odd way that it affects because you can use this if you uh, are growing avocados. Anyone's ever grown avocados? We can grow those down here. There are some varieties that can take the cold. But an avocado tree, especially when it's young, when you see them growing, have real bright green stems and trunks and everything. Well, that bright greenness is the lushness and the tenderness also of the stem. Avocados in the young actually do better with some shade because the bright sun will burn them. But you can spray them with surround with kale and clay, and it actually protects them from sunburn. And so the fact that it does that to protect from sunburn. It has an overall temperature lowering effect on a plant that's completely covered. It can delay fruit maturation because the plant thinks you know, it's in a little cooler environment. And the cooler it is, you know, like with tomatoes, it's a little cooler, they take a little longer to develop and to mature and to ripen. As it warms up, they do it a little faster. Well, you're actually lowering the plant temperature when you use these. It's not a great delay, so. It's definitely worth the trade off if it stops the insects and other things and get your tomatoes first. Now I'm going to move into the biopesticide. Like I said, there is an actual true definition of what biopesticides are. Um, certified by the EPA as certain types of pesticides derived from such natural materials as animals, plants, bacteria, and certain minerals. And there are three classes of biopesticides. Uh, the biochemical biopesticides, naturally occurring substances that control pests by non-toxic mechanisms. Um, that would be something you hear about biochemical pesticide that would be uh, insect sex pheromones, uh, scented plant extracts, things like that. That would be the first class. The second class are microbial pesticides, which are microorganisms that would be any of these microorganisms that is the active ingredient in the product you're using. And they can control many types of pests. And uh, the most widely used ones are species of uh, subspecies and strains of Bacillus thuringiensis, BD, which we're going to talk about. And there are some other Bacillus now that are used as well. And then there's the PIPs, plant incorporated protectants, and those are pesticide substances that have actually been uh, in, put into the genetic material of a plant uh, and protects it from predation. GMOs, everyone's heard of those, the genetically modified uh, organisms. Those are, would be the PIPs. What I'm gonna to touch on next are these microbial uh, pesticides. And once again, like I said, the Celestrogens is PT, that's one most everyone's probably heard of, they probably used it. It's a common solid body bacterium, so it's there naturally. Um, it occurs in the gut of caterpillars, moths, butterflies, on the leaf surface, it's around everywhere. But what they found is that there are specific strains of it that have a different effect than the more commonly occurring one. It is a gram positive, rod shaped, flagellated bacterium. I have to throw some science in there on you. Um, this is a scan and electron micrograph of the Bacillus thuringiensis. You see all the uh, flagella on there. So it is a modal bacterium. It moves around. 
and the DT, that is the overall that's applied to, in the, in the pesticide industry, to the group of Bacillus thuringiensis, all their subspecies and everything like that are called BT. And they produce spores that contain uh, toxins. These spores, they call them delta endotoxins. And there are at least four subspecies of Bacillus thuringiensis that are currently used because of their insecticide properties. And it will list these as the active ingredients and one just call it Bacillus thuringiensis, so they'll be very specific, not only in the subspecies, but in the strain. Like maybe they'll say BT subspecies Kursaki G27, which is strain G27. Um, but the, B, the Kursaki has affected against many types of Lepidopter larvae. Uh, Israelensis is affected against mosquitoes, black flies, and other flies. This one is becoming uh, very commonly used to control mosquitoes in a lot of areas. The Tenebrianus, that one controls Coleoptera larvae. Um, people are really excited whenever this one came along because the, the just straight BT controlling Lepidopteran insects has been used for quite a few years, had no effect whatsoever on the Coleoptera uh, caterpillars and all that that were uh, plant pests. And then when they found the subspecies sort of Tenebrianus and certain strains of it, it controlled uh, several Coleoptera insects, which is nice. And the Aizawa, that one controls uh, wax moss and other moss species. Anyone who uh, works with honeybees knows about the wax moth, where you can use the azida to control the wax moss uh, around your honeybee hives. And then there are, like I said, multiple strains below that. And there are some isolates that have nematocidal activity, and those are currently not commercially available, but they are being studied. Yes? Oh, sorry. Coleoptera net uh, are beetles, the hard shell beetles. Um, those are all in the Coleoptera uh, family. You know, the Lepidoptera, that's the moss and the butterflies. And this is what I think is fascinating you know, how the, the BT works. Uh, here's our you know, insect here. And so you put the formulations out, they can. Hey, uh, so you want to use a surfactant sticker to make them stay because this does have residual activity, at least for some point. It is quickly broken down by UV light, but with a surfactant uh, on in there, it helps to protect it somewhat to so have longer um, activity. And they will also incorporate materials into the formulations to help protect them from that UV light uh, to break them down. But the mode of action is, you know, the, the insect, the larvae used to crawl along, it's eating the plant and it ingests these toxin crystals that are on the plant. And the crystal itself is not toxic to the insect at all, but because of the alkaline nature of the insect gut, once they ingest it, the alkalinity, the alkaline nature of the digestive en enzymes in the insect's gut, the alkaline uh, atmosphere, denatures that uh, crystal protein that went in and it was insoluble before and now it becomes soluble and then proteases in the insect gut will start to chew it up those proteases cleave it and release the toxin uh, there are several uh, cryotoxins one two three i think there are at least or they come up with some other toxins now they found too. And that, that product incorporates itself into the insect's gut, the, the cell membrane in the insect's gut, and essentially paralyzes the insect's gut. The insect stops feeding and starves to death. <laughs> Cruel. But I mean, this is like a horror story. Here's this insect crawling along and sees this thing that. It has no effect on it whatsoever. It doesn't repel by it, it chews it in. But the insect gut already has all the, you know, the atmosphere and the produce and everything to turn what it's eating that is not toxic at all into sudden death. Well, I guess if you're starving death, it's not sudden death. <laughs> Slow death. But the insect takes in what's killing it and takes in something that's completely innocuous and turns it into suicide uh, pill for the insect. Pretty interesting. Uh -huh.
Bacillus solis is the one, another one that this is the same type of bacterium uh, related to the thuringiensis. It's becoming more commonly available right now, and it's used to control uh, fungal diseases and bacterial diseases. And it has a different effect. It doesn't do what the Bt and that produce, you know, all those toxins and everything. Um, you can cook seeds with it when you plant them, and as the seeds germinate and grow, it colonizes the root of that uh, developing plant, and through competition, it prevents infection. So that's how it can protect plants from Rhizoctonia, Aspergillus, or Fusarium. It outcompetes those fungi for the exudates and, and everything on the root surface. It covers the surface and kind of protects it. You can also spray it on the leaves. You can do a, a root drench, and it'll have that you know that same type of effect. Outcompetes the uh, bad guys, and the bacteria also produces lipopeptides once it's on the surface and growing and having its fun, and those will disrupt cell membranes. And you can see this is kind of a common theme with a lot of these cell membrane disruption. You mess up the, the uh, pathogen, the insect, the bacteria, the fungi, whatever, mess up their cell membranes, and they just leak everything out and they're done for. They're gone. Now we're getting to the spinosis, and what I told you about that is now you can find it mixed with insecticidal soaps. And it's based on the compounds produced by this bacterium, Saccharopholysporus spinosa. I put this product up there because it's just a fun fact. It was, this was first discovered, it was isolated from soil, collected inside a non-operational rum distillery in the Virgin Islands in 1982. <laughs> Interesting fact. And I think, what the heck is anyone going to a non-operational rum destroy for anyway? What are you going there for? I mean, no rum, and you go there and you're collecting soil samples? <laughs> so, it's nice to have some odd people in the world because they came up with the spinosin. Uh, it produces a chemical compound called spinosins. These are what uh, they look like. And the active ingredient in compounds that contain spinosin as the active ingredient, it's actually a mixture of the, the two compounds that you see here, spinosin A and spinosin D. Most of it's, I think, about 75% is A, about 25% is D. There are other ones. We've got an A and a D. We've got B and C in between here, too. Um, but these are the main ones that have the um, effect that we're talking about. And it affects the nervous system. Uh, of the insects that eat it or even touch it. So they don't have to ingest this to have an effect on them. Um, this one's another really interesting, I, I love it. Um, you see here, I could go through and explain all this, but that's not important. That's, you'll see that and you can look at it further if you want. But what it actually does, you know, it, it causes muscle hyperactivity. So hyperactivity in the insect, so you figure an insect twitches itself to death. I mean, suddenly the muscles are all going crazy and doing everything. There's nothing to stop. They're not getting the signal because this is blocked, so they're not getting a signal to stop doing what they're doing, and the muscles just start going active, and they just twitch to death. Uh, really yeah. interesting. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> but look how long it might take someone. Can you imagine that laying there twitching? For two days before your following cell has to go. Thank you, Squat. And to me, another thing is, how is this stuff just out there naturally? I mean, there's no understanding all of it. And this is, you know, this has a lot of insects. It does affect mites, which a lot of things have to go. Yes? About 10 minutes. Just a minute. 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> so this one does have an effect on mites. Uh, which is, anyone who's had the two spotted polymites in those, it's really nice to have something like this, not harsh chemical, not something that you have to worry about in the environment, that you can use to control those uh, pesky guys, the mites. There's a whole list, I, I just put up examples, uh, you can find this on the label on most of them. Uh, but 
what you, this it is toxic to honeybees and other pollinators, but only during the first three hours following application. So if you want to use this and make sure you aren't affecting your pollinators, make sure you spray it at a time when they're not active for at least three hours. And once you spray it, three hours later, this doesn't have any effect on them. Is that like custody in the evening when the pollinators are active? Is that a good time to do Yeah, that? unless you're, of course, you're spraying something that's not pollinated. <laughs> <laughs> they, will, they might come out at night. But yes, choose that time whenever the pollinator activity is very low. Does that mean that it doesn't work against whatever you're trying to protect after three hours? Oh, you mean how long does it last? Yeah. Once it's on there? Um, no, because uh, this is up here where they eat it. If they eat it, it has an effect on them. Um, I had that up yeah. So the pollinators usually, you don't heavily spray on the flowers anyway. Uh, but because it affects the insects when they eat it, the pollinators, the pollen, after three hours, there's fresh pollen and, and new nectar being produced. And so the pollen that was there three hours ago is probably not there anymore. And that's why it doesn't have as much effect on the pollinators after three hours. Okay, we'll move through these quickly. Enemopathogenic <coughs> nematodes. This is something that's really becoming more popular. These are nematodes that occur naturally in the soil. And some of them locate their host by swimming around looking for it. Others locate their host by just sitting there and waiting for the host to come by. Um, they will respond to carbon dioxide, to chemicals given off by the host, or even by vibrations as what they're looking to eat or kill moves through the soil. Even the vibration of fungal hyphae growing through the soil can attract uh, uh, fungi trapping nematodes. Um, but this one's um, for insects, I'm talking about animal pathogenic. There is another slide on the ones that affect fungi. But the interesting thing about, another interesting thing about these is they are exempted from EPA pesticide registration. No protective equipment required. It's because it's kind of like um, putting your German, I mean your border collies around the pond to keep the geese away. That's not, EP, they're not EPA, but it's kind of you're using a, a larger, more complex organism. Uh, to do the control, you're just putting it out there as a predator. And so there is no EPA registration required on these. Um, they may start doing it later on. Um, but it's only the free living stage of, the, of these nematodes that will uh, infect. And this is kind of how they have to do their thing. Um, it's not the nematode itself that does the killing, but they have a symbiotic relationship with um, bacteria, and so the juveniles infect the caterpillar uh, through uh, openings like uh, the spiracles, or some actually can go directly into it. And the bacteria are released from the nematode that kills the host, and then um, the juveniles develop into adults. The adults might mate in there a couple of generations before they run out of food, uh, making more juveniles, and then those juveniles exit the mummified body, the cadaver of the caterpillar, and go out looking for more caterpillars to infect. Um, there's two different types. You see this here in this information uh, of the hemopathogenic nematodes. Each one has a different type of bacteria it's related to, and it's the toxins that are produced by those bacteria that actually end up killing um, the host. The nematodes are just using those bacteria to produce food. They feed on the bacteria and on the liquefied host tissue. Uh, this, this is harder to, to see, but this kind of here you can see there are nematodes nematodes to control a lot of different insects. And they're usually quite specific, as you can see here, like this. It controls mole crickets and mole crickets only, but there are some that are less specific. This is a long list of hosts that it has, but most of them are pretty specific on what they'll control. And then there's the enemopathogenic fungi, which is kind of the, doing the same thing that the nematodes do, 
They're infecting the insect and killing it. They feed on the insect itself. Uh, the spores will attach to the, attach to the insect's body. They germinate, they go growing down into the insect. Uh, the hyphae go penetrating everywhere. Uh, there's lots of hyphae form. And then uh, the fungal, the vegetative fungal growth as it grows out and starts eating the insect from the inside out, that's what kills it. And then as the insect is dead and they're running out of food, they'll produce these uh, spore forming conidia, release spores into the atmosphere, whether it's the air, the, the soil they're in, uh, whatever. And then those spores go around and land on more insect bodies and start all over again. And when they sporulate, there are thousands of spores produced. So if you're using it and you get it in there and you get this uh, environment set up, this kind of balance between host and pest, they can last a long time for you once you've applied them. Um, these are some examples of animal pathogenic fungi uh, products that are out there. The most common is the uh, Bovaria. Uh, that one's pretty commonly uh, found as the active ingredient on these guys. This is, you can see, uh, white flies that have been parasitized by the fungi. The fungi is growing all over the insect's body uh, and kill them. And there are specific strains that show different uh, specificities in what they're going to do. Uh, here's some of the insects that are controlled by these EPFs. And you see, uh, they are usually pretty specific into what they'll control. And then some other of uh, these biopesticides and non-chemical approaches that you can use. I didn't have cover these in this presentation. Um, this uses, you know, the pheromone traps, the tractor traps, sticky cars. A lot of us use those. These are very non-specific, but it's the color which is attracting attracting the insects. And then there are a lot of predatory mites and insects. Um, these are just a few of them uh, that are out there. Uh, this company is one that's been around for a long time. You go to their website and you can get the whole plethora of uh, these uh, predatory mites and insects that you can buy. With those, so what you're going to do a lot of times is you're going to buy them, you're going to release them, and then you are going to have to do it again. They don't usually establish a a permanent presence in the environment because they come in, they eat all the insects that are there, no food left, they starve to death, their population goes down, maybe completely disappears. Um, the bad guys come back, you gotta bring them in again. Any questions? Yes? Yeah, use them more frequently, and with what happened, did, did, you, did you look at the uh, aphids closely to make sure that they were all still alive? Because what would happen with these too is, if you, like if you have a, a rosebud that's covered with aphids, and you treat it with some of these, sometimes you go out and look at it, it's still covered with aphids, but all those aphids are dead. But at the same time, when there's a high aphid infestation, there's a reason for the high end aphid infestation, which means there's a lot of rounds. And you spray and you kill the ones that are on there, there's still a lot of winged aphids around that can reinfect. And if you spray on Monday and then go out on Friday, what you might be seeing are the new guys that came in because the insecticidal soaps and the oils have no residual activity. So the guys that you're seeing weren't there when you sprayed. Oh, so I have actually Coming now that there's buds starting to 
Yeah, and those are the new guys coming in. As long as you have no residual activity. So just use it more often. Yeah, insecticidal soap. Try the insecticidal soap with the spinosa. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. There, there is a, a milkweed aphid uh, that's low tiny orange. Well, you grow the milkweed for your good guys, and so you really don't want, unless you have a super high population, you know, the milkweed, you're usually growing it for the beneficials, and so you really don't want to do anything. The best thing to do if you want to get rid of them in that particular situation is to use like a a stream of water and wash them off. Now, insecticidal soaps, you can kind of use those because just make sure you don't have your butterfly eggs and larvae on there when you're treating because it will kill them. So you want to avoid that. That's the best yet. That's the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Recommending putting diatomaceous earth on your dog. Is that correct? No, not really. So, growing up on the farm, I remember my dad used to take the dogs and coat them with cat pens and uh, things like that. And the dog would walk off and shake, and it looked like a, a smoke bomb going off. Or something. But it's not recommended. No, it's not really recommended. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.